artificial intelligence is the hot topic around the virtual water cooler and in corporate uh, boardrooms around the world. So when people hear the term artificial intelligence or AI, the first thing that often comes to mind is unnatural or fake. Um, maybe even something simulated or, or worse yet, their mind goes to sci-fi movies with robots taking over the world. Um, in reality, artificial intelligence is more often used to bring on productivity, improving business processes and improving lives um, of businesses and our customers. So, my name is Aaron McIntosh and I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Act Zero. And joining me in today's inaugural fireside chat uh, to provide some insights on AI and its uses in cybersecurity is Adam Mansour. Adam is our VCSO and Head of Sales Engineering here at Act Zero. So welcome, Adam. Thanks. Uh, a quick housekeeping note before we get started. Uh, for those of the audience who um, may have some questions or are joining us live today, if you do have any questions, uh, please submit them via the question space on the right side of your screen. Uh, we'll try to get to many of those as possible at the end of the session. Um, we're hoping to cover off at least uh, three to five questions. So if you do have them, uh, that is the space to go. So Adam, uh, without further ado, let's dig in. Um, tell us a bit about yourself and your role here at Axero. Well, a lot of my advisory when I was, you know, working in sales engineering for many years was to try to, you know, have people understand the technologies in use in a security operations center. Uh, this is the stuff they relied on to alert them when there was a cyber attack. Uh, and so of the many tools that are out there, um, you know, for a long time now, we've been talking about the management of data. What do we collect? How do we, you know, use it to find these adversaries? And, you know, frankly, uh, as AI started coming along, a lot of people used that sales engineering conversation to sort of understand, you know, what was at play in, in these tools with, when it came to that. Um, uh, now, you know, obviously offering uh, security hardening advice, trying to defeat the adversary with their customers. A lot of the work that I do is just, you know, helping people understand configuration and the tools they may already have and, and how they can be leveraged for something uh, more advanced uh, to stop the type of attacks that typically step around them. So. So let's dig into the AI piece. Uh, I know that's why most people have joined us today. So Gartner noted in its uh, 2020 hype cycle for artificial intelligence that 30% of organizations have actually planned uh, to include their investments in AI in 2021. Uh, so big question of the day, artificial intelligence, hype or not hype? Yeah, I think Gardner has a, well, a hype cycle to try to tell you when a, a particular category of, of service or product is, is right to invest in, right? And, and when you should sort of see the benefits and see the vendors and see everything sort of mature to the point where your dollar goes further. And uh, while we've been calling it different names, you know, there's always been a focus on data and cybersecurity, right? Big data analytics. You hear a lot of people talk about security information and event management, right? They keep talking about data collection. Um, recently, antivirus, you know, starting to take a, a different, you know, next gen AV focusing on machine learning detection, which is a subset of artificial intelligence and, you know, you know very wild claims sometimes coming out. So there's a lot of uh, advertising and hype around it. Is this an 8K television? Is there really programming available for it uh, at this point in time? And I think that, you know, we've been at this for a while. You can you can see real benefits from this. You can start to see the, the returns uh, from from the investment in, in managing data this way uh, for companies specifically in cybersecurity. So I think, no, not high, uh, real measurable outcomes uh, can come from this. Okay, and so speaking of outcomes, how can uh, a new technology like AI uh, really help solve the complex issues that have been around in cybersecurity for years now, um, you know, or even the new ones that are coming up? Yeah, I think one of the main things that artificial intelligence, specifically things like machine learning and, and just the new advances in data science help uh, with is uh, the outcome of, of trying to find an adversary that's continually trying to step around uh, technology in order to uh, basically you know, either hold you ransom or steal your data or extort Bitcoin out of you in some way. And, and as we start to see a lot more news stories around uh, these attacks affecting the large organizations with traditional cybersecurity programs, uh, a lot of people are starting to understand that the, the way that the analytics function and the speed at which they function uh, needs to be improved, right? We need to get better at finding these anomalous, uh, basically, 
patterns that these attackers are using and surface them quickly to the point of prevention so that we can avoid material damage, right? Downtime and, and, and recovery, um, putting our businesses, you know, at a, at a grinding halt. So when you think about uh, the outcomes now, uh, speed and accuracy are, are really what people are sort of striving for. They really want to find hacks faster. They really want to shorten their time to respond. They really want to make sure that they're getting the most out of the data that's costing them a lot of time and money to store and, and, and manage. Yeah, and now you mentioned data. Uh, many of our audience members might be thinking, you know, I don't have big data issues. I'm a, a small to medium sized enterprise. Um, you know, I have that under check. You know, where's the value to AI to them? Right, and I, this is a good misconception around when people were plugging it as big data, right? That the AI science was a way to deal with extremely large data sets that it could only function with extremely large data sets, that there was only value uh, to the very large. And for a small to medium enterprise who's frankly, you know, like the movie Moneyball, trying to understand how their dollar can go very far in this, in this approach, right? Constantly searching for new ways to get lower total cost of ownership across IT. They don't think of building a very large data warehouse and hiring a data scientist and all these traditional ways of implementing machine learning and AI as, as valuable at all, right? They're, they're just real big hits to the bottom line in order to surface a, a, you know, a nuanced detection that may be just slightly better than exploit prevention or whatever next gen tool they've got in prevention already. And so uh, what they need to understand is that these tools uh, that have artificial intelligence built in them can function without the data stack. The data is a way to sort of analyze the patterns, but a lot of the technology that actually prevents and uses the outcome of that um, to find and stop the attacker can, can do so without you having to create the data on behalf of that company. So if you're leveraging a third party provider that uses these mechanisms to identify and stop attacks, you're, you're definitely not gonna have to start layering on all these extra tools and data sets just to be able to feed them something for them to be effective, right? They should be able to leverage the data set that they're analyzing in the environments all over the world to then bring you the outcome. So that even if you just have one laptop and it's not connected to the internet, you can still use an AI detection to kill a new threat. Okay, and in terms of the data itself, I know like you're collecting massive amounts of data. I mean, any of this, any cybersecurity uh, prevention uh, company is doing that, you know, they're ingesting that. Are there any, uh, data privacy concerns you know anything new with ai yeah certainly i think when there there was even a book called the circle i think it became a movie with tom hanks and it was almost like a, a, almost a direct comparison to you know modern day alphabet and you know a lot of people are villainizing and starting to create this privacy regulation frameworks like gdpr and bill c11 in canada ccpa in california and, and state to state you know it's changing all the time when you, when you think about the, the new focus on how we're collecting data and, and where it's going, how it's stored, who's using it, how's it being shared, there's an incredible focus on you know, giving people access to this information, right? I think in 2001, we probably started talking about it with the Patriot Act in a very real way in terms of data sovereignty and where data goes. Um, and then in, in other ways, when you think about the Health Information Portability Act, right, being able to move from provider to provider with your health information, you know, who owns the data and how are you able to move it securely from one place to another, uh, you know, was another huge focus for HIPAA. And so as we start to think about GDPR and consumer information and the privacy of the data inside of our machines, especially if you think about the fact that we're broadcasting from home right now, I think uh, many people would sort of realize that like, you know, access to your camera and microphone and your keyboard and, you know, your, your files is um, frankly, luckily for us, not required, but it's also the same kinds of things that the, the attacker is trying to do. And so there's this kind of misnomer that in order for us to defeat the adversary, we have to have at least as good, if not better, access to all your peripherals and devices and data that they do so that we can analyze what's going on. Has it been touched? Has it been accessed? And this is where I think that one of the, the most misused words, metadata, it comes into play, right? We don't, you know, in order to at least defeat the adversary as we understand them today, need to know, um, you know, the content of your files. We don't need to take the file off your computer. We don't need to have, you know, this access to your microphone and keyboard and every keystroke you're making so that we can, you know, uh, undermine your, your, your privacy and, and your own personal uh, privacy, right? Um, luckily, just understanding what the file does, which is really how, you know, malware and scripts and activity works and understanding the network traffic in terms of, you know, the, the 
the computer code inside of it is really what we're after from a from a detection response uh, perspective. Um, and other than that, the patterns can be pretty specific. You talk about user behavioral anomaly detection. I don't have to check, you know, the keyboard strokes, uh, you know, and your cadence of writing to know that it's not you. There are some very cool startups in the. Uh, RSA security conference a few years ago, like Unify ID, that had this kind of cool way of, you know, identifying you based on all kinds of biometric patterns. But th that's that's frankly not what we have to do to defeat the kinds of threats that are shutting businesses down today. We don't have to collect it. And the importance of SOC too. I mean, there's a whole discussion to to, to describe your change management, the rigor that your team goes through, the the unimaginable amount of of process, documentation, separation. You know, using you know, all the best practices you can to make sure that if you hand somebody your data, they are really good custodians of it. Um, and so, you know, vendor management due diligence comes into play here, but, um, you know, just understanding that we don't need to do that or our companies shouldn't need to do that. Uh, they need real specific reason why, and they're going to have to be more transparent with their customers. The SOC 2 is a great step. Uh, privacy policies on their website should be a lot clearer to understand. It's not just about cookies anymore. We need to know everything you're doing at all factors of the business because, uh, you know, your cookies are only one part of it. Yeah, good point. Good point. Now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to go back to something we talked about or you mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, generally, there's a lot of claims in the market about AI helping cybersecurity, uh, detecting and stopping attacks. I mean, that's fairly well known. Uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of marketers uh, are guilty of sprinkling in terms of AI and ML, like a secret sauce or, or magic pixie dust, um, and that it will cure everything. So in real terms, um, can you give some examples of how specifically uh, machine learning and AI um, help uh, businesses? In particular, maybe going back and hitting a little bit on, uh, you had mentioned scale and speed. Yes, yeah, specifically, I think AI uh, has always gotten uh, a bit of a, a, a cool, you know, it's a marketer, it's, it's good for a marketer. Let's not be too hard on the marketers, right? The, the idea is that they have to deconstruct, you know, what is obviously a very scientific process that is applied to data sets that uh, frankly would seem very similar to a database query or would seem very similar to, you know, a typical alert. Oh, so you have some logic in your, in your code it's better than the more savvy you get as a buyer, right? The more you sort of you become a little bit skeptical of, of is this logic really any different than the logic I was, I was previously using to find this kind of stuff? Um, and you know, as a sales engineer, frankly, there's all there's always a divide between the sales understanding of it, the customer understanding of it, the marketing expectations of it. Uh, and so it's basically you got to you got to level set with everybody and explain what it's for. And if you think about the uh, the function and speed of, of artificial intelligence and the kinds of things that it can use, specifically machine learning, and we take you know uh, searches as an example, that's a that's a very simple place to start to understand the speed and accuracy of something. A typical database search, the typical sort of SIM rule or this typical antivirus heuristic, right, will have a couple of different things that it looks at um, in a linear fashion, right? So if I see something in this folder, if I see this particular connection, if I see this particular uh, file that I've seen before and, I, and I've now had a, a you know, PhD in comp sci classify this as bad, uh, then I'm going to stop it. Right. And, and if I see the same thing, if I see a couple of login denies followed by a success, I'm going to I'm going to alert and say somebody's trying to break into the environment here. And these are very simple trip wires for an attacker that just says, OK, well, I can get your password somewhere else. And just, you know, use the tools you use and, and nobody's ever going to stop you from from doing all the things I want to do with your scripts. Right. And so the, those those rules just fail. Right? They just they look at too little to be able to say, this is Aaron on his computer accessing something from the Caribbean, or this is Aaron's uh, computer accessed by somebody else transferring data where it shouldn't go, right? And so when you think about, you know, uh, what it takes to sort of identify that, um, there's a lot more factors that go into it. Is this Aaron's computer? Is this his browser? Is this the normal day that he logs in on? And not having to make it linear logic, not after connecting all those things to say it has to be exactly this and any deviation is an alert because then you have Again, this multiplier effect of how many alerts you're giving people. So on an average SIM, for example, you get about 500 alerts a day, right? And the average person can handle you know, 10 if they're a good analyst amongst everything else we're asking them to do. So if you say, okay, well, where's the direct impact of something like AI? Well, fewer alerts, fewer false positives, fewer things to look at, right? Um, fewer uh, you know, chances for the logic um, to just go false positive and then shut off an entire section. 
where you're now missing false negatives, right? You can train the model to say this doesn't look suspicious, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the model itself, the, the, the function in machine learning that's actually applying the rule is going to, you know, uh, therefore cut off all access and now it's just sort of this whitelist for all kinds of bad behavior, right? So that, that's, that's traditionally where you're going to see, especially in SOC operations, pretty inside baseball, but um, you know, uh, how SOC operations is going to see the benefit of this. And then if you're going to a provider, you know, fewer alerts coming to them that don't mean anything and fewer misses because they didn't, you know, hide something they needed to really take a look at. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned the Caribbean on a cold day in Toronto. I'd love <laughs> to be detected in the Caribbean right now. But uh, <laughs> yeah. a little bit, you know, uh, according to McKinsey's uh, research on the state of AI in 2020, they had actually indicated that 50% uh, of respondents um, we will be looking at adopting AI in some form in their business in the next year. So some of our listeners might be wondering, you had just touched on SOC. Are there things that um, they can do to implement AI in their own security operation centers? Yeah, I mean, uh, frankly, you, you're likely going to be borrowing the AI uh, from, a, from a technology provider or from a service provider that is, is leveraging it to make their tools and, and their, their function a lot more um, accurate and a lot faster, a lot better cost of ownership for you in terms of the stack. When you think about companies that you know want to leverage data science, and we're probably back to that survey, specifically AI, and they're saying, well, I want to augment uh, the analytics that we do, and we want to be able to make sure we're making better decisions, predictive decisions, using artificial intelligence, right? So you you have companies that, that try to invest in this area, and the data concept really comes up, right? They, they might acquire companies uh, just for their data set, right? Just to make sure they can apply these, these types of uh, things. Sometimes, you know, ironically buying them without even knowing what they can apply, uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, there's no real outcome that they kind of set out with. They just buy the data because it's a big data set and there's a lot of fields in there. And so, you know, you, you sometimes see companies, you know, erroneously apply the logic that more data means easier ability to create data science and a competitive advantage or something like that. And if it's your core business, you know, yeah, I can see your, your, your competitive advantage being, you know, part of your data acquisition. But if you're looking at, you know, cybersecurity and it's not your bag, you're not a software provider, you're not, you're not a tier one SOC, you don't, you don't have in-house data science, you're not going to be able to get the outcomes that you need because you need somebody that's really savvy at applying these models, applying these rules to the data set, right? That's, that's what a data scientist does. You need somebody on the other end who's very savvy at training it, right? That's going to label the data and give you these kinds of inputs to the data scientist in terms of what models they should be creating, you know, how are the labels going to define false positives and accuracy? How are we going to then leverage the data, right? It's, it's kind of reminds me of like Google's using machine learning. Do I stop looking at websites? No, you still need a user, right? Like a threat hunter or analyst who's going to digest that data, who's going to use it for containing threats or, or notifying users or, or understanding how they need to remediate their environment more. So, I mean, I could see people investing in it, but it's not a it's not a silver bullet, right? And and starting that far back of the pack, if it's not your core business, not a real good strategy, even for a very large stock. Yeah, no, I, I, I tend to agree with you there. And, you know, you had mentioned a couple things in there about the, the human element of AI and machine learning. And, you know, we've been warned for years that AI is going to come and steal all the human jobs and, and that we'd all be just in the service industry. But, you know, what can you explain maybe a little bit more about that, that role of the human threat hunter or the human uh, data scientist or the analyst? Um, maybe going a little bit depth about how that's growing in this field. Yeah, I mean, at this point, we haven't gotten to the the area of, of artificial intelligence where I think, you know, we can affordably replace the most expensive and most powerful computer uh, at the same time that we have that we can we can afford, right, which is a person. I think a qualified analyst is always going to play a role in AI because there's just too much of their involvement, right? This The, the, the types of things you're doing is finding another adversary. Right, it's another person, right? So you have you, you know your logic and, and their logic is, is fundamentally the same, right? They're going to try to find ways around your defenses. You're going to try to find what they're doing and circumvent those uh, those defenses, right? Um, and the machine at this point may be very good at identifying, but there's so many patterns 
there's so many different uh, things that are going to be brought to an individual's attention in order for them to take action. There's certain things that you have to play as a daily role into this to, to refine it as a science right now. So, you know, the, the, at least for the next probably 10, 20 years, you're, you're likely going to have uh, a relationship to the analyst where you're just taking what is now massive amounts of data and making it more digestible at, at cost for, um, you know, a, a company so that they can have better cyber defenses. But I don't think that you're going to be able to completely remove the analyst who fun functionally has to still explain uh, and research and still perform uh, an activity to stuff to talk about. Okay, so we stopped the threat. How to get in here? How did you know? What did it touch? What did it do? Right? People are going to need answers uh, about questions. These privacy offices can't ask the AI what it thinks about the data you lost. Right? There, there's there's a lot to do uh, in infosec and in cyber, and, and the job changes. Right? Let's let's not you know say that the the job doesn't change, but but leveraging you know the human mind in that role you know shouldn't be done for repetitive basic triage tasks of, of a poor database you know sending you alerts all the time right we should have very low false positive very high accuracy alerts so that the you know the threat hunter or the analyst can do their job much more efficiently and functionally there's a lot more security jobs around ai that need to to train it and, and, and to use it right yeah and, and you mentioned average you've mentioned adversaries enough and i think you i think you've probably covered this off a little bit but you know, we are seeing the hackers are leveraging AI themselves. Um, you know, how, how do we use that to keep ahead of them? You know, yeah. yeah, I mean, when we say, you know, the adversary is using AI, I think, you know, are they, are they using, you know, sort of these penetration testing tools to, to create an artificial intelligence, you know, monster that's going to go through the environment uh, like Hollywood, right? Uh, I, I think that there's a a fundamental sort of cat and mouse game that always goes on, right? You, you have this, you know, role reversal where at some point we're better than the adversary in terms of our ability to detect and prevent, or they don't have the tools to monetize or distribute or, you know, end up with uh, kind of these zero day impacts, all these exploits that they can run, right? And, you know, now you see them sort of very organized and able to quickly dismantle with these teams um, traditional cybersecurity operations centers. And part of that research is still to understand AI enabled endpoint protection levels, uh, understanding where those tripwires are and see if there's a way to go around it. Right? We think of you know, double extortion ransomware, right? The idea that, okay, maybe we can't ransomware your machine because the AI is really good at finding and killing it. But in the process, we were able to copy your data, which wasn't a detection we killed. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to use that data against you by leaking it publicly until we get paid, right? So the, it's a human adversary and, and they, they are studying it just as much as us. It's, it is machine to machine in terms of, you know, the speed and the software and the things that we're deploying, right? We have to detect what they're doing. They have so many opportunities to try to work around that. And so they, they're going to be conscious of the, of the technology and conscious of the process we're using because as we share information between each other, we all start to look very much alike, right? And so it's sort of a single attack surface of all of these companies and not just, you know, just what you're doing, right? You're not just out running, you know, your competitor. They, they're trying to hack everybody. Well, certainly great feedback thus far. And thank you for uh, answering some of those questions I had and actually going well beyond. Um, I'm gonna take a look now at the audience Q&A board, if you don't mind. Let's see what we have. We do have, I actually have a good number of questions in here. So uh, the first one I have is, um, what are the data types collected to make AI effective? Yeah, I think it's funny. It, traditional SOC data collection, especially recently, like uh, endpoint detection and response data, right? So like what the machine is doing as a human would try to draw a diagram of like, oh, this registry was modified, this process was modified. Uh, those types of fields, right? File names and the user that started the process and the file location and the network location and all that typically collected by EDR, right? So endpoint, network, cloud, uh, very good data sets for this. Um, that are sort of the raw information, right? So, you know, 
the, the types of stuff that your firewall creates, syslog creates, the stuff that Office 365 creates and their event stuff. That, that's sort of the starting point for, okay, now we can look at activity and judge what activity is good and what activity is uh, suspicious, right? The more we have, the better, right? If we can understand the browser and the workstation and the user and the IP and all these other factors, now we can start to make a more informed decision about whether there are you know, things that have changed in the situation that now the model can analyze, right? So um, those are sort of the big three areas in terms of collection. Um, they, they what are bad things to collect, right? Like dumping your files in a repository and saying, these are my files and nothing else. You know, not, not for this purpose anyway, is that gonna help us really understand when there's been a modification of the file because it changes all the time. Um, so I'd say that's sort of the data set to, to collect, sort of the traditional data set. It's, it's, it's where you put it and what you do with it that defines whether it's real AI or not, right? Are you just dumping this into a sim with a one variable correlation rule? Are you, you know, saying that your heuristic detection on your antivirus is, you know, artificial intelligence because it thinks about the heuristic? Like, you you got to use the traditional form, you know, computer science, like go back to the science of it and say, you know, let's deconstruct. Okay, AI, what are you using machine learning? How are you using it? Can you explain what your, you know, how many features of your model there are, right? These are sort of the buying questions to understand. Have they collected the data? Are they able to use the data effectively in ML? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, next question we have here. Um, we had one on privacy concerns. I think we've probably answered that one. The next was, uh, what can we expect to pay for AI-enabled services? Will this make data security more costly? I mean, it, it, what we're talking about here is efficiency, right? When we think about how we're able to collect, detect, respond, investigate, hopefully guide the customer through what their uh, job is uh, to, in response to all this, especially if it's outsourced, but certainly even if it's in your own sock. Um, the concept is that the, the, the storage should be less because you should be able to understand from your collection and your models, whether you're finding and stopping things, right? You should be able to lower the amount of labor spent on, you know, investigating the alerts and moving to, uh, you know, a much more efficient response, right? So you should start to see ROI almost immediately because you're not sort of just hacking at this almost never ending false positive puzzle. Uh, and you're not just storing every single piece of raw information. Right? People tell me, hey, should I log from my switches? I said, have you ever looked at a switch log? What part of the adversary do you think you'd be able to determine from that log, right? Associated, associated, right? This is not very valuable data. So sometimes you have this kind of garbage collection, garbage in, garbage out. And, and AI will kind of be the equalizer for you because it'll kind of tell you immediately, is this, are, are, are we able to track an adversary? Are you able to put something through this model that will tell you something suspicious? And if not, then you know you probably should start to see better dividends, right? You should be better managers of it. And let's face it, if you're dealing with a mature company, if you're outsourcing this, um, you should see a cheaper cost, right? It should be on par with it, especially as you start to talk about the scope, right? Traditional security modeling uh, in the SIM world has been based on events per second, meaning you probably don't log your workstations, you probably don't log the places the attacker is going to go because it's so expensive, and you're making these trades all the time about, oh, I should just log things and aggregate them for my security equipment. So you try to cut the pile down. And that's not gonna be effective. You're not gonna be able to trace things properly. You're not gonna be able to see things early. Uh, but AI that doesn't depend on that model can help you very efficiently manage the data and it should be cheaper as well. Okay, cool. I think we have uh, one or two more questions here. Uh, unfortunately, I think we are out of time. Um, we've quickly run out of time. That half hour went very quickly. So we will get back to you folks um, that did have some questions. We'll send those out uh, to you. Um, Adam, thanks again for your time and valuable insight. Um, it feels like we've really begun to dig into the subject. Um, I know AI is absolutely burgeoning technology and uh, our answers will probably change as we go and our depth of learning across the board will um, only season itself over the next little while. Um, again, thank you to our audience members. Um, like I said, if we didn't get to your question, we will get back to you uh, ASAP. Um, for more information about AI in security, in cybersecurity, um, we're constantly churning out new materials. We're placing those online. Um, you will get a uh, link to a recent podcast that was uh, completed by our head of data science here at Axero, Alexis Yelton. We've got a post on anomaly detection up there by one of our lead data scientists, uh, Brennan Gibbons. And we have a host of blogs and other information available to you online. 
So thanks again for joining us today. Uh, we hope you've learned a little bit more about AI and, and uh, our team here at Act Zero and how we can help you cover more ground in your journey to securing your business. Thanks, everyone.